Well, good morning. Welcome to all of you for uh, to Open Door Church. Thank you for coming and being here with us. And we just pray that today will be a day of blessing and joy. And so I was reminded to remind you that after church, there's going to be a time of fellowship over next door in the community center. So we hope you can stay. And I don't know what they have for you, but I'm sure it's good. So please stay and hang around for a bit. And that will be a blessing. Uh, let me read to you from the Word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, beginning in verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the Word of reconciliation. Would you bow with me, please, for prayer? Father, as we bow before You, we thank You for this day and for the blessings of it. Lord, thank You for the beauty of it and, and just for the opportunity to be here together. I pray You'd speak to our hearts today that You'd draw us to Yourself. Lord, that, that You would speak to each heart in the way that, uh, that they need and in a way that they can understand. Dear God, we love You, and we thank You most of all that You loved us. We thank You for making it possible for us to be new creatures, for us to be different, for us to be changed from what we were, for giving us hope, for giving us strength. We praise Your holy name. Bless this service now, for we pray in the wonderful and blessed name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, good morning. It's good to see you. I brought a picture for you to see something that maybe you'll know what it is. What is that? Does anybody know? What is that? What is that? It's a what? What is that? Come on, don't be bashful. Tell me what it is. Can you tell me? A bird. It's a bird. Is it a, is it a real old bird or a real young bird? What do you think? Chicken. That's not a chicken. No, no, no. A, bird. a chicken is a bird, but that's not a chicken. A bird. It's a bird. That's right. What kind of bird? Is it a young bird or an old bird? What do you think? A young bird. It's a young bird. How do we know? How do we know? Because it's a chicken. You see where that bird is? Now, young birds, baby birds, where are they supposed to be? Where do you expect to see them? Chicken. Where do you expect to see the baby birds, the little bitty birds? Where do you expect to see them? In a nest. In a nest. That right, that's right. But where is this bird? Is, he in a, is that bird in a nest? No, it's not. It's on the grass. It's down on the ground. And you see how he's got his mouth wide open? And so what's he wanting? What does he want somebody to do for him? Hmm? Anybody else? What does he want somebody to do for him? Food. food. That's right. Food. We know about that. So whenever you want your want food, all you do is open your mouth real wide and your mom helps you, right? Is that right? No, maybe you better say please. No, just open your mouth. But the baby bird opens his mouth really wide so that he'll be able to have something to eat. But if he's out of the nest, maybe he's fallen out of the nest and you see that baby bird in the grass. Guys, listen. You're walking in your backyard. You see this baby bird in the grass, and the baby bird is there, and he doesn't look like he can fly. Boys, boys. Doesn't look like he can fly, can't, does he? And so he needs help. So what do you want to do for him? Looks like he needs help. He can't fly. He's got his mouth open like he's really hungry. So what do you want to do for him? Would you like to help him? How many of you would think, boy, I'd like to help that bird, right? I'd like to help that baby bird have something to eat and be in a safe place. Because down in the grass isn't necessarily a safe place. If a bird can't fly, it's not a safe place for the bird to be. So you'd want to help that bird. And it's going to take you something. You're going to have to go find something for it to eat. And that takes some effort. That takes some work. You're going to have to be able to make sure it's the right thing. And it's going to cost you time and you're going to have to care for it. Okay? That's right. But, to, but you look at the baby bird and you say, oh, how sweet and how wonderful, and I want to help. But do you know, sometimes the ones that we see that need our help are not birds, but people. Did you know that? You'll see people that they have great needs. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe they're going through a hard time, but they need somebody to help them. And it's going to cost you, it's going to take you, even if you want to help them, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so whenever you do that, you need to remember that that's what Jesus wants. Because whenever He saw people who had needs, He wanted to help them. And He so often did and was able to help them. So when you see a baby bird, if that baby bird's up in the nest, you can say that's where the bird needs to be. And whenever you see people and everything seems okay, that's a wonderful thing. But when you see either one in need, you say, God, how can I help? What can I do? So let's pray and just thank God that He loves us. And when we're the ones who have needs, He takes care of our needs and He's made it to where we can help each other. Okay? Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and pray. Father, thank You that even in the times when we seem to be out of our nest, when we need someone to do something for us, dear God, we know that You're always with us and You care for us. And Lord, when we see others who are in need, I pray that, Lord, we would desire to help them, we'd want to help them. And Father, that we might just be able to minister one to another for Your glory, for Your honor. 
Bless the children now. I pray, Lord, that the children here, Lord, that they might not grow up thinking that everybody just always ought to do something for them, but that they will want to know how they can do something for others. Teach them that, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, wait just a second. Everybody sit down just a minute. We're going to let the children that are up through kindergarten go to class. Everybody else needs to, the older kids need to stay in here. And the reason for that is we don't have the space. They're working downstairs. We don't have a good space for the older kids. So all of you kindergarten and below, you can go to class now, and the older children will stay with us. Okay. I received a call on Thursday from a 93-year-old woman who is very dear to us. She was a member of the church that uh, I pastored in New York for 23 years. She called to tell me that her husband of almost 70 years was dying. And then she asked me if I would officiate at his funeral. She reminded me that she'd asked me the same thing eight years ago whenever she knew that I was leaving the church. She said, when we need you, will you be there? I said, if I'm anywhere close, I'll be there. Well, we made our way over there on Friday afternoon and visited with him for a couple of hours. He wasn't at the point that he could speak, but I hoped that he at least recognized this heavy southern voice of mine and know that uh, in that hour that we had come to share with him that we cared. And while we were visiting on Friday, she repeated something that she had told me on the phone the day before. She said this, she said, I am so grateful that God has given me the strength and the health and preserve my life so that I could be here to minister to my husband at the end. Now she's 93. He's only, he was only 89. She was 93. The doctor told her whenever they sent Bill home from the hospital, he said, you can't do this. She said, I can and I will. And she did. She did. So she had prayed that God would allow her to minister to her husband. She asked God to extend her days so that she would be there to do that. She was not resentful about the added burden. She was grateful. She was grateful. Life. Her life had become one of caring for Him. Well, within less than 24 hours after we saw Bill and Una, we received notice that he had passed, that he had gone to be with the Lord. In a world where the norm is to live for yourself, there are still others who are living for the sake of others. And that should be true of all of the children of God. You remember that we looked at Paul's words in Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, where he said, But I am hard-pressed from both directions. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. A desire to be with Christ, but being willing to be here for the sake of others. Now living for Jesus is always going to involve living for the sake of others. Did you hear me? Living for Jesus is always going to involve living for the sake of others. So this morning I want to share with you the example of three individuals that are mentioned in the second chapter of Philippians. Individuals for whom this was true. Beginning, of course, with the Apostle Paul himself. Now with each of these, I'm going to highlight a different activity. But I want you to see these three same basic attitudes that are shared by the three of them, and maybe we can learn from this. 
In fact, I would encourage you to do as I have done and allow God to speak to you about a life, the life that He wants you to have, a life of peace, knowing He's in control, a life of purpose, knowing He has you here, not just for your own sake, but for the sake of others, and that you might experience the life of blessing, which these three men knew, and which all who will live for the Lord Jesus will know. With each of them, take note, if I don't mention it, that what is exemplified in each of them was first demonstrated in the Lord Jesus. In the Lord Jesus. So I want you to see that living for the sake of others means sharing with others. It means sharing with others. Paul's life was one of sharing, especially sharing the gospel. In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, we hear Paul declare this. He says, You yourselves know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we know that the Apostle Paul had a great impact on others as he shared with them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to know it wasn't just about what he shared, and it wasn't just about the methods that he used in his sharing. I want you to see that he was effective because Paul shared sincerely. Sincerely. People know very quickly if you're a fake. They can see through the hypocrisy. But Paul, his message was received because he shared sincerely. Verse 16 of, of, he, of Philippians chapter 2, it says this, "...holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain." You see, Paul had a message that was so vital, a message to share so vital to those that he cared about, and he cared about all of those for whom Jesus died. Now that included everybody he could get to. Everybody he could get to with the message, he knew that Jesus died for them. Do you believe that? It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter whether the world esteems them or despises them. Jesus died for every one of them. Now notice that he described the message of the gospel as the word of life. The word of life. He not only had a ministry in which he, in which he shared important words the Word of God, but he had a ministry in which he shared the meaning of those words because the word that is used here for word is not the word just to talk about a spoken word or just a word on a page, but it is that wonderful word logos. We know that Jesus said that he was the logos. He is the word, but he says, I shared with them the word of life. Now, you know that he shared Jesus with them. But even the word that's the words of the Scripture that he shared with them, even if he were, wasn't speaking specifically about Jesus, he was sharing with them the meaning behind those words, being able to share what all of that meant, the logos of life. People have a hard time deciphering this life. They have a hard time understanding what it is all about. Well, he shared the words of truth, and he fleshed them out, to include the desired communication behind those words. What was God saying? Here's what He's saying. What was He declaring? Here's what He meant. The Apostle Paul was able to do that and to share with people just what the Word says. He said He shared with them holding fast to that message. Now that indicates the purposeful sincerity which was His. He sincerely believed that God's Word was what everyone needed to hear. Now, was he sincere? I want you to think about the depth of his sincerity as I read to you Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Folks, that is a sincerity as deep as any man could ever achieve. He was sincere in his concern for others. 
for his countrymen and for all that he came in contact with. Notice that he sincerely believed that what he shared with them would make a difference. Look at verse 16 again, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ... When we come to that time that Christ returns and sets up His kingdom, He said, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. In other words, He believed that people's lives would be changed and that was why He did what He did. Do you have that faith? Now, if you're trying to evaluate everything this side of heaven, you're going to miss what it was all about. You're going to miss some things. He said, in that day, in that day, I am being as faithful as I can, holding fast to the word of life, sharing it with others in order that in that day I'll know that all of my efforts have meant something. It was not all in vain. It was not all empty. Wouldn't it be awful to come to the end of the life and look back and say everything I did was just leaves blowing in the wind. It meant... Nothing. Cluttered up somebody else's life is all I accomplished. That wasn't Paul. And it can't be us. I want you to notice that Paul also shared selflessly. He says, now listen to this, this is powerful. He says in verse 17, But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith... I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Now we know that in certain sacrifices that drink offerings of wine were poured out to accompany the offerings. The picture is that of a sacrifice in which the Philippians are the priests offering their faith to God and Paul's life is the drink offering being poured out to accompany that offering. Now if that was necessary, if that's what his life meant, we think about pouring something out and it's gone. It's vanished. Paul says, if that's what my life is about, so be it. I will rejoice in such a life as that, and may you joy with me. May you have joy with me. You see, Paul rejoiced to be able to give his life, if necessary, in order to honor Christ. He rejoiced to be able to give his life, if necessary, in order to help others to faith in the Lord. He rejoiced to be able to give his life, if necessary, to build up the church that might be able to minister to other people. This is a mystery, my friends, to most modern-day believers, how Paul could have such a heart as that how he could be as selfless as that. All I can say is he was that much more like Jesus than so many others are today who came that he might lay his life down for our sakes. Now if the Bible tells us, and it does, that what God is doing in our life is making us more and more like the Lord Jesus, right? Isn't that what it says? then if we are growing in Christ, you know what that means? It means more and more my life is going to be laid down for Him. And in that, Paul says, is the greatest of rejoicing. So let's rejoice together in such a thing as that. Notice also that he shared submissively. Verse 18, he says, You too, I urge you, Rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Now when Paul spoke of his being poured out, he was pointing to his death, which would come simply because he dared to declare Christ to all people everywhere that he went. The thought of death is normally accompanied by tears, but Paul is telling them to not be overwhelmed by sorrow. He knew that his death was coming soon. He wanted them to allow their hearts to be filled with joy. His death would not be a defeat, but a victory of submission to the will of the Lord. He counted it a privilege and pleasure to give his life for such a cause. Now those are the words, these are the words of a hero. The Greek biographer Plutarch wrote of a brave Athenian soldier who returned from the battle of Marathon, bleeding and exhausted. He rushed into the presence of the city officials and he uttered only two words. Chereti Sheroman. That means rejoice, for we 
rejoice. And as soon as he spoke those words, he died. Even so, the Apostle Paul, even as he faced the prospect of his death, felt that there was occasion for him and for all whom he loved to rejoice. If he would be permitted to die for the cause of others, then that was a death to be celebrated. Celebrated. Laying down your life for the Lord Jesus, and when the end comes, hallelujah, praise God, we'll go to be with Him. Living for the sake of others, as demonstrated by the Apostle Paul, is about setting as a priority, sharing with others. Ministering to others so that you might be able to share with them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's consider also what Paul says about Timothy, who will demonstrate that it is also about caring about others. Not just sharing with others, but also caring about others. I want to say to you that Timothy cared sincerely. Look at verses 19 and 20. He says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be con concern for your welfare. Now the word that is rendered genuinely or naturally in the King James Version means sincerely. The idea is that Timothy would regard their interest with a sincere tenderness and concern. What Paul saw in Timothy, he said, was a kindred Spirit. Have you had those friends that you knew that you were kindred spirits? You saw things the same way, you felt about things the same. A kindred spirit. That's what the Apostle Paul says about Timothy. Because Paul knew that Timothy cared for the people there at Philippi in the same way that Paul cared about them. Now his concern for them, Timothy's concern for them, for them came largely from the fact that he had been with Paul when the church at Philippi was founded. It is difficult to have a sincere concern for people when you don't have any past or present connection with them. The way to have a concern for them is to learn more about them, maybe to walk where they've walked and be where they are. Now you know that yesterday in this region, though we are very prone to complain about the weather, and we have ample cause, I suppose. In fact, one man said to me, God never intended for anybody to live in the Berkshires. It's just that the winters are too harsh up here. Uh, and I said, well, a lot of people didn't hear that message, and they came, so we, had to, we need to be here. But yesterday, while we were enjoying such a wonderful day, uh, Martha and I were a bit concerned about the weather. Not because of what was happening here, but what was happening yonder, over yonder, back, we looked at the weather map, we saw what was going on, and there is that place where we began our ministry down in northern Louisiana, and always when I see the weather map, I think about those good folks that are down there in that little rural community, and I saw that the storms, heavy storms, were coming right over them, and I was concerned, and we prayed for them for their safety. Now, it's been a long time since I've been there. It's been a longer time since I've pastored there, but we we're concerned about them. I saw that the storm was coming up through Arkansas, that it was coming across Arkansas, and I have so we have so much family that is there in that place, and we were concerned about that. We heard that, that there were storms over toward Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we have loved ones there, a niece that is such a wonderful young lady, and she's there, and so we thought about them. You see, while we were enjoying a day of ease and, and good weather, they were experiencing storms. Well, Paul was able to write and to say that Timothy had a like concern with him when it came to the time of, when it came to the matter of the people at Philippi and what was going to happen with them. Paul sent him to the people of Philippi. Why? Because he knew that Timothy cared for them. You know the people that I want to minister to me whenever I need to be ministered to? People who care for me. Not people who do it out of obligation. people who care 
for me. I do not believe Jesus called us to be so that we would do things just because we're supposed to do them. I believe He called us to draw close to Him so that we would have the same heart He has so that we could be kindred spirits with Him and minister to people because we care about them. Let me ask you, to whom has the Lord sent you? Paul sent Timothy to Philippi. To whom has the Lord sent you? You have a relationship with them? You are the one who cares sincerely for them? Know that God will use you in their lives. Notice with me that Timothy also cared selflessly. He says in verse 21, For they all seek their own interest, not those of Christ Jesus. Paul is drawing a contrast between Timothy and these other people. There were those who seek their own interest, not the interest of Christ Jesus. I do something because I want to be noticed by someone else. I do something because I want to earn brownie points with God. Well, he's not so easily deceived. Timothy was different. He was no longer at Philippi, but he was concerned about them rather than about himself. Why? Primarily because Jesus was concerned. Now, invariably, when disaster strikes near someone you care about, you want to know that they're okay. There's times that, I mean, every time, every time it seems that there's storms that take place, and I'll just use that picture again, storms that take place down south, and you hear about tornadoes or whatever coming, tearing through that land, and you think, ah, oh, Pastor Jim has family there. So many times I walk into this church and people say, how's your family? Are they okay? Are they okay? See, you don't know them. But you know me, and you know I love them, and so therefore you are concerned about them. That is exactly the way that it should be. Not interested in our own ease, not interested in our own safety, not interested in our own pleasure, not interested in our own reputation. Timothy was not like that. He was not one of them. He was like the Apostle Paul in being willing, being selfless in what he was doing, not caring for himself, but caring for what Christ cared for. Concerned with the things of Christ, His kingdom, His honor, His interest in the world. You see, what we are to do is we're to care for people, but to care for them selflessly. Notice that Timothy also cared submissively. It says in verse 22 to 24, But you know of his proven worth, Timothy's proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Who was Timothy? He was Paul's assistant. He had served with him in the cause of the gospel with all the... He had all that love and respect for him, the love and respect that a son should have toward his father. That was all there. Their ministry together was one that was characterized by that and their relationship with one another, their tenderness and affection they had for one another. You see, Timothy had proven to all that he knew how to submit to Paul because Paul had authority over him. Paul says, he looks to me like a father. But notice that it does not say, Paul does not say, Timothy served me. Notice what it said there? It said he served, what? With me. He served with me. Who was it Timothy was serving? Serving the Lord. They served together. He respected Paul as that elder statesman, as that, that older uh, brother in Christ, as that father in the Lord. He respected him, but they served together. We know that we're not servants of one another. We're servants of God with one another.
And I believe that's the way it ought to be. Each of us have different responsibilities in that service. Paul certainly had the greater responsibility and therefore he had the greater authority. But both of them kept their eyes on Jesus. That, my friend, is proper biblical submission. The one who has the greater authority before God has the greater authority, the greater responsibility has the greater authority to enable him to carry out the greater responsibility. Now, Timothy rejoiced in such a relationship with Paul so that Paul trusted him to be able to send him out to minister to them. You see, Timothy cared submissively. He would wait until they both knew that it was time for him to go. Living for the sake of others, as demonstrated by the Apostle Paul, is about setting as a priority sharing with others. Living for the sake of others, as demonstrated by Timothy, will involve a sincere caring about others. But our study wouldn't be complete without considering what Paul says about a man by the name of Epaphroditus who demonstrated that it was also about serving others. Now we notice that Epaphroditus served sincerely, it says in verse 25, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. He refers to him as his brother. Now when one believer calls another believer brother, it's an acknowledgement that they are both the children of God. It is also an acknowledgement of a common affection they have for each other. Now I have two brothers in the flesh. I have two physical brothers. I don't see them very often. We don't even talk very often. We don't even text each other very often. But yet, when I get a chance to see them, there's a bond there. There's something there. There's something there. Nah, we don't do a whole lot of hugging or any of that kind of stuff. But it's just as good. A bond. My brothers in Christ. You see, I've got two brothers in the flesh. I've got many brothers and sisters in Christ. In Christ. Had the privilege of working over the property of one of my brothers in Christ yesterday. And I want to tell you, it was hard work. It's always, work's hard. Okay? Anybody ever tell you work's hard? It's, it's always hard, but we were working hard and we were working together. And you know what? It was a great time of fellowship, brother to brother. We used to minister together for years, for decades. We ministered together. We don't see each other very often. We don't text. We don't call on the phone. But when we're together, we're brothers. Isn't it great to have brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ? He also refers to him as a fellow worker. The word speaks of two work together into an, in an endeavor that does require great energy. Serving others. There's always a great amount of work. He refers to him as a fellow soldier. Epaphroditus and Paul had gone into battle together against a common foe. Folks, if we are the children of God, we are soldiers together in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. There's an enemy to be defeated. There are people to rescue. We have that responsibility. He says not only do we have an affection for one another, not only do we accomplish much together, but we go into battle together. Brothers in arms. Such descriptions let us know that Epaphroditus was sincere in his service for Christ and that led him to serve others. The Christian life to him, folks, was not a game. The Christian life was not a pastime. He was a soldier in God's army and a worker in God's field and both of those require a great deal of sincerity. But notice he also served selflessly. He describes him in verse 25 as who is also your messenger and minister to my need. The word messenger is the one from which we get the word apostle which means the one who is sent by another. In our modern world that word would be the word missionary. Now when you think of a missionary, what comes to your mind? Well, if your own child were to become a missionary, the thing that would come to your mind would be separation. Maybe it would be sacrifice. Because they would have to leave you behind to do what God called them to do. But the life of a missionary by very nature is a life of selflessness, of leaving those who you care about. Now, Epaphroditus was not only a missionary, he was also Paul's minister. He ministered to Paul and he ministered to them. The term literally speaks of one who serves others at no cost to them. 
but at great cost, great cost to himself. Ministering to others. For you don't expect anything of someone else, but you are the one who's giving in sacrifice. That is exactly how he describes uh, Epaphroditus. He was a man who was faithful. He was a man who was selflessly taking care of Paul, even as they had sent him to Paul to do, and now Paul was going to send him back. Now we know that we're all called to be ministers and we're all called to be missionaries. You see, we're all called to serve others selflessly for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Epaphroditus apparently was concerned about others, but not so concerned about himself. And he had become sick while ministering to Paul. But do you know that even in his sickness, he was not thinking about himself? He was thinking about those in Philippi who were so concerned about them. Isn't that an amazing person? Whenever they are suffering, whenever they're in great, great difficulties, but they're thinking about someone else who's sad because they are suffering instead of focusing entirely upon themselves. Listen to what it says. It refers to him in verse 25, also your messenger and minister to my need. Listen to what he says, 26, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. God had mercy upon him, and because it would have broken my heart if something had happened to him, it was also sorrow for me, but God delivered us from that. You talk about selflessness. Study the life of Epaphroditus and what little we hear about him and know that that's exactly who he was. But notice that he also served submissively. Listen to verse 28. He said, Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. If he's there ministering to you, I'm not going to be as worried about you. I know you have someone there who has the same heart I, ha I have ministering to you. Therefore I have sent him. Once again, we see that in order to live for the sake of others, we have to do so in submission. Epaphroditus was torn between staying with Paul and ministering to him and going back to Philippi and ministering to them. He couldn't be in two places at one time. Paul settled the matter for him and sent him back. And he went. You know, it's our nature. To, be in, to want to be in control of our own lives. We, we just like to be in control of everything. We like to push the buttons to, to make this door open. We like to be able to make decisions about everything that happens in our life. That's just who we are. That's what we like to do. But we know that that's sin. We know that that's wrong. We know there's only one who is Lord. There's only one who should be in control, and that is the Lord Jesus. Epaphroditus' concern was not about himself, it was about others, and he was willing to do whatever Jesus wanted him to do. And so, in the latter part of this chapter, we see in the lives of Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus the importance of living for the sake of others. Now, that is counterculture. That is going against everything anybody else is going to tell you. Look out for yourself. Think about yourself. Protect yourself. Plan for yourself. Let it all be about you. Because nobody else is going to care about you, right? Not true. Not true. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we care about each other. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we share with each other. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are concerned about serving each other as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all of these things, we need to do it sincerely, not pretense. Be done with any pretense. Do it sincerely. Stay on your knees before God until you have the heart of God. We need to do it selflessly. Stop letting the enemy say to you, look out for you. Look out for number one. Think about yourself. You go through life that way, you're going to be going through life offended by every person around you because they're not going to think so much about you. And we need to go through life submissively, submissive to His leadership, willing to do whatever He tells us to do. Those who are willing to live for the sake of others may go unnoticed by the world, but they will not go unnoticed in the kingdom of God.
Listen to how Paul tells the people at Philippi that they're to treat Epaphroditus when he returns. Beginning in verse 29, he says, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. What you could not do, you sent him that he might do. This man, along with Timothy and Paul, are heroes in the service of God. The truth is that every one of us can serve the Lord with the same energy and passion that they had. Nothing has changed. It is still about that. It is still true what Jesus said that in order to take up your cross and follow him, you have to do what? First, deny yourself. That is what you see in Jesus' teaching, in the life of the apostles, and in the Word of God. I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. To let the Lord speak to you. Let Him have a word for you. I'm going to ask Chip and Jan, Lisa to come and close us out in just a moment. I don't know what God said to you through this. As I read this, I thought, Lord, thank you for your teaching. Thank you that other men have been obedient to you. Help me to be likewise. What is it God's saying to you? Father, I pray for the people here. And I pray that each of us might desire to experience life the way you intended. Bless them, Lord, I pray. May we each be so close to you as to have your heart to share with those in need, to care for others, and to serve. That you might be glorified and not any of us.